Welcome, everyone. This is Max from Paper Gold and Common Ground Finds with a new, uh, the first episode that I'm launching of my Destination Unknown. You'll get that reason why later on at the end of the interview. But I'm launching today with Phil from Smithville Flats, New York, really, aka the book peddler. Welcome, <laughs> Phil. Um, we won't tell everybody that this is really the second time we're talking, but, but <laughs> okay. they'll, they'll know sooner or later. How are you doing today? Sure. I'm 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 doing very well. Thank you, Max, and thank you for having me on the channel again. <laughs> I appreciate you, I appreciate you doing this. Yeah, I wanted you to be the first person I interviewed because I've been following you for a long time. We've definitely had some Instagram uh, likes back and forth, and a little bit of comments here and there. And I love what you're doing on on many levels. Uh, number one, I know you own now two book locations. Mm -hmm. Yep, and I've. I've been able and privy to watch them grow with you as you've grown in the business. Uh, so now that you own two locations and I know that you sell online as well, let's get away from the online factors, but let's just talk about what is, what is the day to day life mm. of the book peddler sourcing, buying, selling, creating content for your channel as well but what what is your day-to-day -day life for people to sort of get a behind the curtain look at it well well currently it looks a little bit different because i'm actually redoing both of my shops i'm refining them down um so it's been a ton of lifting but there is a ton of lifting that happens on a daily basis i would say i i, I move and process hundreds thousands of pounds of books i mean it's um I don't sit there drinking tea, put it that way. It's <laughs> constant activity. Um, I try to, I've, I've uh, create a lot more discipline to, to get particular things done. Like I always try to get up at least uh, 10 listings a day. I do have someone I've hired to be a lister uh, at this point, but yeah, it's, it's following up on leads. Uh, it, it's communicating with, with, with people reaching out, that's pretty uh, uh, constant. Um, and it's always trying to, it, it's, I'm always trying to, to uh, a lot of material does come to me. I don't mm -hmm. have to actively go necessarily to book sales or estate sales at this point. I do it because I do enjoy it. And if there's something good enough, I, okay. I want to get in there and get it, of course. So you know, day to day life, it, it's it's not as romantic as uh, as most people would be believe it to maybe be. So um, it's work like anything else. You're running your own business. So knowing your numbers, keeping your receipts, sure. um, trying to figure out uh, different angles you can take different uh, uh, maybe marketing, um, doing what other people aren't doing. I guess, uh, uh, in, in testing things as well. There there's, I wear a lot of different hats. Do, do we? I would say you probably wear all the hats. Uh, yes, I, I pretty much. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Yep. I think, you know, you said something that really strikes a nerve with me. You're moving boxes. I think that's the one thing that book owners really never talk about, which is the amount of time and labor that yes. we are moving inventory from one section to another, yep. moving that death pile of books to another section to get yes. listed. Yeah. Th that is a full, full day of work when you're, when you're, it's all said and done. It, it, it absolutely is. And actually like at the point I'm at uh, now, the less times I can touch a book, right. You know, when it comes in, get it processed, uh, everybody probably has some sort of death pile, but I'm really trying to do my due diligence to eliminate that the best I can. Right. And I think what it comes down to is just refining your, your processing ability and getting it out of the way for getting it online or on the shelf. So more can come in and the cash flow keeps coming. How, so if, if you get a phone call and, and a customer says, I'm coming in, I'm going to bring you three, four boxes of books. And let's just say, are you cherry picking them? Or are you buying all three or four boxes? Um, I try to cherry pick anymore. Right. If if they just want it gone. I mean, um, I, I tend to look at it differently now when I'm getting called to a house or someone's coming in. 
I'm kind of providing a service basically to take this stuff off your hands. Um, and, and so if you're going to make me take all these boxes, now I talk tough. Now I'm a little bit of a softy, uh, depending on who it is. Um, but you, but you are providing them a a service at the end of the day, they need to get rid of this stuff. I I don't, um, you know, try to be uh, too cheap, uh, or whatever, but at the end of the day, I got to make money. It's my time. Right. Yeah. In, in my paper gold, uh, Patreon group, there are a lot of uh, members who do free pickups Yeah, and they do fantastic, which just sort of, it tells me and you that there's so much inventory out there Yeah, that, yes. you know, I, I'm just a firm believer that use books. You can make a very comfortable living selling used books with a little bit of dangerous knowledge mm-hmm. and, 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 and the desire. I know that you and I both work long hours. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. But I also know it's joyful hours. It it is. Um, and having a physical location is is probably I would say not for everybody. I mean, I get messaged uh, quite often, at least like once a week, of people that want to open a brick and mortar yeah. location. But I think it really does take a particular type of person to to do that. Um, maybe even online as well. I think you can develop the skills. But you got to be able to really persevere. Not every day is a good day, um, and there are disappointments and there are stresses. Uh, but you got to work. You got to figure out how to work through it. Some people like the idea that they think that they can work sixteen hours for themselves. Right. But you you might start really missing a paycheck some yeah. days. It's not all uh, uh, roses all the time. Maybe that's a given, but everybody's different. So yeah. Uh, right. Well, you have two physical bookstores, but in my business mind reality, I think you have three stores because you also have your online component. Yeah. And you have customer service and issues and fires to put out every day. Yes. With, with that end of the business. And so yeah. you have two locations, but you also have that universal location of, of yeah. eBay. Um, yeah. And so that, you know, that's a whole nother set of issues that you have to deal with on a daily basis yeah it it is but but i will say the the selling online i'm i'm in a very very uh, uh my location there are not a lot of people around there there are more cows than people <laughs> so i've had to kind of create a destination point right um, for people to to come and they do come uh i get more people coming from outside of the area than actually in the area but the online has helped provide um it's provide provided more consistency. Sure. Some book owners, they might sit in their store all day and never see a customer. It, it happens. Uh, I know a few of them I'll go in and visit during the week, you know, mm-hmm. or I used to anyhow, right. I'd be the only person in the shop. For, Don't for you hours. think though, that a brick and mortar nowadays and going forward, they almost have to have an online component attached to their physical location. I think you'd be doing it yourself a disservice if you didn't. Um, but I, I do know guys that have been able to make it work, but these are guys who are very well established. They've been selling for like 40 years right? and, and they have the name and they have consistency of people coming in. Um, one individual, he has entertained the idea of hiring like a college student to try to help him with his inventory uh, and, and put it online. Um, but it might, his particular situation might be a little diff, difficult. He has a large book barn and, um, no space to do anything, <laughs> but yeah, to answer your question, I'm sorry. Uh, um, I, I do believe that, that if you have the ability to take advantage of the tool, you would reach a worldwide audience. So, yeah, yes. when I, when I was working, uh, down here and managing a antiquarian bookstore, this was pre eBay, pre Amazon. Um, and I remember clearly thinking, you know, my owner is pricing books, but we have to physically wait for somebody to walk through that door to want that book. Or if you wanted to go through the extra effort of making an ad in abe.com 
yeah. you know, or or the old catalogs and produce a catalog like some of those older booksellers you're talking about. Yeah. Uh, but that's all. That's uh, that's another niche inside your business, which takes time and effort. Yeah. Um, I just remember physically understanding that you know, boy, it's tough business to wait for someone to walk in. And what I love about eBay mm -hmm. is you you list that one book, yeah. and the world is now your customer base. It, you know something, Max. Early on, when I started this business, as you just said, uh, sometimes books can sit for a very long time, especially some of the higher end ones. I, sure. I actually two days ago made the uh, largest book sale I've ever made, so I was very happy about that on eBay. So I was excited. What was uh, the subject matter? We don't need to know price, but what was the it, subject matter? It, it was ec an economics book by uh, John Ray, eighteen thirty four. I, I believe he was an inspiration to some of the Austrian economists. Okay. So it was in its first state binding. Everything was right. And the buyer from Italy bought it. And um, so that was it was a beautiful sale. Um, and that actually that book walked in the door. I didn't even I bought the box of books. I didn't realize the significant of uh, significance of that title until mm -hmm. that actually got put aside for quite a while till I had the time to look into it. Right. So you bought a box of books from a walk in customer. It sat around. Subsequently, you started going through it. You you realized what you had, and then someone bought it from Italy online. Yep, yep. So, yeah, to me, that's what the book business is now. And, and by the way, Max, that book was going to be thrown out by a library. How often do you and I hear? I hear that story all the time. Yep, it's all it's, the time. it's quite incredible. Yeah. Uh, certain people that you would think would have more discernment. Uh, yeah. uh, for, for something like that. In my experience, most of them don't. Right. So that includes historical yeah. societies. Yeah. Um, and, and I get calls, I get calls daily. I work with a lot of estate sale companies who, you know, mm -hmm. and not are they just um, selling items out of houses, but a lot of them are also clean out companies. Yep. And they'll call me as the last ditch effort for the book collection. And if I don't go get it, yeah. it's gone. It's in the, it's in the garbage. It's gone. Yep. And, you you know, just to circle back uh, to what I was saying previously, um, so I don't have a fra fragmented uh, <laughs> thing. What, some of the books can sit a very long time. And so when I started, um, though, I, I, I wanted my customers to get first pick. I still kind of do that. Okay. But the thing is, is, is you can't really always be dependent on people right. to come in and buy. So anymore, for the most part, I'm getting them online immediately to, to reach that worldwide audience. Or I was creating a museum is what was happening. Yeah. And you're going, I'm going book poor then, you know. Yeah. So Th this is boy, this conversation can go in a thousand ways with just that comment. You know that mm -hmm. one of the things that I've been doing, and I know we talked about this before, is I've been doing whatnot for about six months oh. now. Yes. And I hate the idea of book sitting. Yeah. I, I, I just hate it um, because I know it's a good book. Mm -hmm. I know it's online, but for whatever reason, it's just not selling. Yeah. I don't mind starting that at a $5 auction. And let's just say it's a hundred dollar book. Yeah. If it, if it gets 12 bids and sells for uh, 45, $50, I'm fine with that because yeah. I've moved it and now it's going to another home. Sure, sure. There's nothing wrong with right. that. In in you you'll create a, a customer. I mean, if if um they're happy and they got a good deal, they're mm -hmm. gonna keep coming back. So it's all about like cash flow to me. As yeah. long as you buy the material right, you can do that. Right. Um, and I think yeah, I think a lot of online booksellers who may be newer to the art of selling books. They see a comp and then they they get magnetized and stuck to that comp. Yes. And they can't they won't even come off of the ten dollars just because they know they somebody else got ten dollars more for the book. You're 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 right. I actually know an individual, a uh, really great guy, and he started doing Amazon. Um, and uh, you know I won't say too much, but I'll say I recognize myself and him at an earlier age in my career so to say um to to where i wanted to get that top dollar for everything and right. i would not budge uh and 
he's the same way. He wants to get squeeze everything out of it, but you're going to wait. I heard a uh, individual, um, I'm forgetting his name. It's Daily Refinement. Yeah, Chris from Daily Refinement. Uh, and he has a saying that, uh, so, you know, it's better sometimes to get some of the money all of the time than all the money some of the time. Uh, yep. Nothing's a guarantee. Right. Somebody comes in online and undercuts your book and it continues to happen. Yeah, especially on Amazon. Especially on Amazon. Yeah. So, you know, I, I like moving material right. as well. Yeah, I think you're you're like me where you just you love you love sourcing them mm -hmm. and you also love selling them. Not, it doesn't have to be about the money. It just has to be about moving them and, and the art, the art of selling books. Yeah. Which yeah. has been forgotten because so many people think buy it, list it, sell it, end. And I don't believe that. I, I want to give the best customer service to my online clientele as I can. Yep. And sometimes I'll throw in a free book for them without even telling them, let's say they buy a book on, uh, you know, Mayan history. Mm -hmm. And if I happen to have a lot of Mayan history in inventory, yeah, I'll just put another Mayan history book in that. And I want those repeat customers because I... I just want them to come back to my store all the time. And so I treat it like a physical, a physical bookstore, yeah. even yeah, though very, the only thing physical is the books are in my garage on shelves. Yeah. Very, very good. I, I, I've done the same, um, you know, and uh, it's, it, it, it definitely, people really do appreciate it when the book gets to them to the way they want it. Like I really tried to train my lister how to do her due diligence mm -hmm and what to look for and how I want the pictures done and sure. yada, yada, because um, these are people out there mm -hmm. and I want them to, to receive, receive the material exactly how it is on the online listing. So in all the years I've been doing it, I just got my first negative feedback because of uh, the buyer claimed that four plates were damaged, but there was no photo evidence. There was no right. refund. So uh, my track record is pretty much, I never deal with returns, maybe one every eight months um, mm. for, for maybe it got damp. I don't actually none of them, none of those returns, only one has gotten damaged in shipping a big volume set. So, yeah, I, I pride myself mm. on, on give, doing the best I can and making it right. Yeah. And the only way to, I think, from my experience, to deal with when you have a book with plates in it is you have to do the counting of the plates first. Yep. Put a little strip of post-it note in it. Mm -hmm. on that plate and let's just say the book had 25 plates mm -hmm. because you're only getting 24 pictures on ebay i yeah. would just take a picture of those the side of the book with the post-it note sticks coming out of it just yeah. so you know you've just so you know you've counted them ahead of time yeah it uh that particular situation they said four were da were uh damaged but um you know i i find it hard to believe and they're they're very non-responsive Right. You run into this. Um, they all know, want a, a partial refund. They all want a partial refund. It, it's a small <laughs> percentage of people. What's kind of funny is that the uh, the lower end stuff, it's funny, but like there's more people that seem to want to cause a problem over a $10, sure. $20 book mm -hmm. than a $500 book. Right. So, but anyhow, we always do our due diligence yeah. and um, make proper listings. So well, I just feel good. You have one negative feedback that, I mean, now, now you're a real reseller. <laughs> yeah. Now I made it. <laughs> now, now that's forget, that forget making 5,000 dollars from a book. You got a negative feedback. Yeah. You're good. You're good in my book. <laughs> All right, good. I mean, I probably have four negative feedbacks in 12 months and each one of those just bothers me, but yeah, it, you know, that's a, I try not to think too far. I know that I'm doing my my job, and if there is a real issue, right. I make things right. You yeah. know, you it's you can miss things. Um, it happens. You know, and uh, at the end of the day, I am quality control, so I will take the responsibility and not scapegoat <laughs> my lister. So, so how do you how do you determine a bookstore book for one of the two locations? Mm -hmm and or an eBay book that is also going to be in the bookstore, but also has a possibility to sell online. So I guess I'll, 
I'll say a couple things. If if say I have a fifty dollar book that's real sharp, sharp corners, never been cracked okay. open. Uh, but it's in my shop. It's a little bit of a slower sell. Maybe uh, it's a philosophy book. Uh, that's not huge here. Um, so uh, what I'll do is I'll list it. And generally like a book like that, I'll just put it on the shelf in, in storage. Cause I don't want people manhandling the stuff. Okay. Um, I try to give my customers a first go at it. And that includes my YouTube people. Mm -hmm. um, if I'm finding material uh, on New York history or the hunting, fish and firearms, that stuff I'll kind of hold off a, a little bit. Uh, some of it gets listed immediately and it goes on, it will go on the shelf still. And I, I mark it so that it's known that it's an internet book. Right. Um, the one thing I get neurotic about with some of the rarer stuff is there's definitely people that don't know how to handle those books. Right. And um, so, yeah, I, I kind of, will handle it for them if need be uh, because they could ruin your, your book. Mm -hmm. um, you break the spine or uh, people just aren't really conscious sometimes right. of what they're doing, but that's, that's what I do. Most everything gets listed. Right. Most so do you, when you think about an online book, do you have an ASP in mind? Do you have, okay, it's gotta be $50 and up or, or is uh, it subject matter? So I, I used to, I used to not touch anything, uh, less than $25. Okay. Um, but if anybody sees anything up for less than that, it's usually because I was experimenting. Mm -hmm. Like I'll still do that. Like, uh, run a paperback experiment and list a hundred and do some type of deal or something. I'm always trying to game eBay yeah. or work with it. Um, my average sale price is uh, $45 a book. Well, that's um, pretty good. <laughs> yeah, it's like 45 to 50. It, yeah. it, it, it varies. I try to keep it above 25. But if the book, I believe, is a fast seller right. and it's under 25, we could bang it out. Um, we'll, we'll put that up, you right. know. But it, now let's go back to that uh, book on philosophy, the, the imaginary one we're talking about. Let's yep. just say it's like a, a book on Immanuel Kant or something. Mm -hmm. um, and if you had it up on your eBay store for 25 and someone offered you 15 for it, are you countering or are you just moving that product along? It, it depends how long it's at. I mean, right. uh, you know, I, I accept a lot of offers. That one would probably be a fine offer right. or I, I might say 20, sell it for 18. Right. Sometimes I do a little bit of back and forth. It, it's really all situational. I think if I just put up a fresh listing for like a $40 book and uh well i just accepted one today it was a 40 dollar book i listed it at and i accepted 30 uh, accepted a 30 dollar offer okay it really just de depends on what it is can't uh I'd probably say give me 18 bucks it's yours ship tomorrow and they yeah. accept it you right. know so but, so are all of your books dated with a code inside in in light pencil or something so you know the age uh, mo most dealers do that i yeah. don't okay i i just know which really isn't good enough i <laughs> should be coding them you know where i'm going with this okay <laughs> <laughs> but uh but yeah i uh i don't i don't i have a i, I probably should at, at some point start but i'll have to see how it how it goes I, you know i'm gonna give you my hack right now for this Okay. And I'd I think you're gonna, I think you're going to love this. Mm -hmm. Every book that gets listed in the year 2024 in my store, mm -hmm. the price ends with 0. 0.24. Okay, there you go. So any book that was listed last year in 2023 mm -hmm. has 0. 0.23. Wonderful. So I sold the book the other day, a higher end book I sold and it had a 0. 0.20. So I've had that book. It was listed in 2020, mm -hmm. but I, but if, if they actually bought it for the price I had on it, but if they had offered me $40 less on the $150 book, I would have taken it because I would have recognized, man, I've had this book since 2020. 
Yes. So that's yes. my that's my hack that I give to all the paper gold members. Yeah, no, that's that's wonderful. I'd highly recommend doing that too. Yeah, absolutely. You really know how long your inventory you've had it. Yes, yes. I think there are very few books out there to where it it's okay to sit on. Right. And those are those aren't being bought daily. <laughs> so like right. a Lewis and Clark first edition is going to remain at a certain level um you would know, you ever go to an auction house if you had a book like that i don't no i don't think i would you would just uh, hold it and um yeah but uh um well i guess it depend when it when it would get there and what the auction house would be charging but right. no i think i would have it in my little museum section of the shop. <laughs> so, so, okay, so you're admitting there's still a little part of you that doesn't want to let it a, go. Okay, a little, a little bit with something <laughs> like that that you might see once in your lifetime. Right. Um. You know, from its historical, social, cultural value and whatever. You know, it's something special. I don't have to take a best offer. You know, I, I a book like that, I'd really like to get what I'd like to get right. out of it. Um, unless if I was in real dire straits or something, um, you know, that's almost kind of investment type, you know, I, but, yeah. uh, but you're still going to feel sad when it gets sold, even at your price a little bit, but it would be fun. It, it'd be fun just to own it and just to be oh, able yeah, to yeah. handle it for that, uh, uh, you know, short period mm -hmm. of time. So that's what I enjoy the most is, is, and I have handled the Lewis and Clark first edition, um, so I really think that it's so cool. I loved history. I had wanted to teach early colonial history. Um, and now I get to actually handle material from that time period right. from individuals that I've read about. And I think it's, it's, it's just, and I still get to teach in a sense and people get to see that material. And that's really special to me. So I love yeah. it. Yeah. And I would think, I would think we can delve into this, that where you're geographically located, you are getting a lot of early American history, historical books. You're also probably getting a lot of books on outdoor game and wildlife. And yes. So I, am I, I'm guessing you probably have a very strong clientele mm -hmm. of those people who do know your store very well. Uh, I do. I do. And honestly, I don't need a hundred people in my shop. I just need the one person that's going to make that buy that makes right. your weekend or week. But, but I definitely do. Um, a lot of people around here, they appreciate antiques as well. I love antiques. I used to have a mixture of both. Um, but, but not anymore, but for certain choice ones, I will, uh, uh, bring into the shop and if they do go well, uh, with the books, you can, marry some things together nicely to make mm -hmm. a more desirable buy for somebody. So, but um, yeah, I love my customers. They're some of them, some many people they're not even really interested in books. They just come to check in, make sure everything's right. good. And I think that's so great. <laughs> so, I, But they're probably glancing out of the side of their eyes, seeing what's new on the shelves. Oh yeah. And they, they yeah. will buy and they've got me picks too. They, yeah. they, I, I mean, I'm their guy. You know, and if they hear there's books around, I'm get I made I've made some of my largest purchases off of off of these folks, and right. and then so it's really cool. And then they come in, I say, pick something out for yourself. You know. Now, do you have a new inventory uh, section in your store where anything new goes there first before it goes into its subject matter section? I've thought about doing that. I never had. Um, but I do like that idea. Um, in, in, I, I, I thought about, uh, as I'm redoing this shop of doing something like that, having right. that section. Um, so, so I might do that. I might, but usually I know what my people are looking for and I have it some, and I'm showing it to right. them, you know? So, uh, but that, that's usually how it works yeah. out. Yeah. And also the beauty of, I think what you do is you're able to source, in a specific type of geographic region. Mm -hmm. And when you're sourcing, you probably already have buyers in mind that you know are going to be interested. Yes. And so although cash may not have changed hands, you probably already have a lot of these kinds of books already sold before you even buy them from 
the sourcing place you're getting. Yes. It makes it easier on me. If I'm at an auction, I can buy confidently. Mm -hmm. uh, I know uh, what I'm going to sell it for and who I'm going to sell it to, generally speaking. It, it does make life a lot easier. I have safari books put aside from my guy who's coming up from the island in, uh, he's coming up, I forget, April, May. Mm -hmm. But he's he's going to buy them. He, he doesn't squabble with price. He knows I give him fair treatment. And he's he's he's, he's my number one guy for that kind of stuff. Gone. Right customer service he he wants he wants you to get the books for him he'll pay he'll pay your price yeah and, that's, and he's coming back every year yeah he's a, and he's a great guy he actually owns a, a charter fishing uh company he's like phil you know when i when i'm when i go you're gonna be handling all my books so again <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> so i'm like gosh dang it he's got quite an impressive uh collection yeah. But it is fun because you're kind of also building these people's libraries, yeah. um, finding them good, relevant uh, uh, material that they've uh, been looking for, or it would just add wonderfully to their collection. So it's pretty cool. I love doing that. Yeah, yeah I was watching one of your videos where you uh, were at an auction. And the one thing that I couldn't believe is you, you, had, you said that uh, it was not an online auction. It was only an auction that you had to be there physically yeah and i said i, I said i'm 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 go i'm flying up <laughs> just so he's got competition because let's be honest was there anybody else there competing against you nobody that was a threat to me put it that way no way i mean that does not happen often though right like that uh i got i think just extremely lucky because that aspect wasn't promoted that the, there were so many high-end native american pieces that the books were kind of undervalued sure. um actually the best books i found were in a box lot that weren't even up for separate bids right <laughs> it, you know we're talking early 19th century native american encounters of the area right it is truly incredible um so that that those definitely came from one person's collection who probably passed away or some, you know. Yes, they you know. they did. They did. Um, and yeah, I got uh there was a little bit of luck a luck involved. I didn't have competition like someone like you coming in, you know, but there are certain ones in there that I would have kept going. I mean, right. absolutely like those early encounters, uh, it's just a no-brainer. I, I would have paid up, you know, a lot more than right. what i what i did but that luck thing is funny because it took a lot of work to get lucky your eyes have to recognize things right you know now, do you do you ever you know i don't think you do but do you ever feature some of these books just on the instagram side of things um you usually uh every now and then i'll select something out right. i'm not good with instagram i haven't taken my due diligence to 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 learn it right like i should Generally speaking, most things go on my YouTube channel. Okay. And, uh, you know, I'm just showing kind of what I'm buying, what I'm picking up, what's out there. And if anybody has interest, they can contact me and right. we can do business, you know? So uh, that's how that's how I, I do that. And I have done great business through YouTube. Right. Um, you know, I do make money off of YouTube. It does pay a bill, which is kind of neat, but for an eight minute uncut video to, to sell a, a good price book. That's, right. I love the people on there. They're really awesome too. Yeah. They're really cool. Yeah. Well, <laughs> yeah. For those, for the audience who uh, Phil is new to you, go back to his old videos. You can see him going into hoarders homes. You can see mm -hmm. him going to very beautiful <laughs> homes and yeah. sourcing books. And he's literally giving you a how to on his way of sourcing books, which is amazing because You've, you've had everything from um, early uh, Native American narratives mm -hmm. to the occult mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. to just generally antiquarian books. So it's, it's always fascinating to watch you go into the home and I, you, your eyes are always lit up right before <laughs> yeah. you start source. And I, I can see your eyes lit up and you, you're just hungry to get on in there. You, you know, what's kind of fun too, is when I'm showing this stuff, I don't always necessarily know what I have all the time you know like i have an architectural book set it's this french guy i know his, i don't know how to oh, say i know name. who you're talking about like who that's it yep. so i yep. looked at that set 
and I knew there was value there. You know, long story short, you develop instincts. Yeah. But I'm showing them on video, uh, but I don't have – I usually people are seeing it fresh for the first time. Now, sometimes I've done a little homework on something mm -hmm. if I have the time, but sometimes my audience will educate me right. on – like my buddy called me up immediately. He's like, listen, Phil, that's like real top stuff you got there. Put that aside, blah, blah, blah. And um, so that's also the fun yeah. of it. I'm learning he's, as he's I go. He's an through. iconic architect, of course, but he also he also uh, engineered and architect uh, airplanes. Oh, wow. Yeah. So, wow. Um, yeah. And, he, awesome. and you may want to be checking for a signature in some of those books. Mm, okay. Because that's a very highly sought signature. You know something, it's also, I guess, an example of if I wanted to, um, maybe I take that allotment of, of the set and sell it to somebody that, that specializes in architectural books. Right. I, I can give them a really good deal and you can network that way too. If, if, if you want to, I mean, you, I guess people don't have to, cause anybody can list it, right? but by developing a relationship like that, this person might come across New York state hunting and fishing right. and, you well, know, I'd be, if, yeah, if I could be of any help to you, I, I know, I, I know we've talked and I want to get you on what, what not, but, um, Instagram has really allowed me to have relationships with um, brick and mortar booksellers who will buy straight from me. Wonderful. Um, and I'll always give them a really good deal because mm -hmm. I need to leave meat on the bone for them. Sure. But sure. There, you know, I probably have relationships with probably over 15 physical bookstores across the country. That's and wonderful. each one of them, like you specializes mm -hmm. in a different category. So I remember getting a collection of books on uh, mycology and mushrooms and oh, yeah, yeah. and all that great stuff. <laughs> and I had a bookstore that I deal with and that's one of their, that's one of their mm -hmm. key subjects. And he bought, you know, five, six boxes of those books from me. So I, that's Excellent. where Instagram can help you is to reach out to those um, bookstores because sometimes on YouTube, not everybody has time to watch the book peddler on YouTube. Sure, sure. But, yeah. But they're all on Instagram when they're waiting in the car or waiting in line at the bank or something. And that's yeah. where Instagram's doing your advertising for you. Yeah, you're 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 right. It's actually um one of the things that I, I would like to spend a little more time on and get better at it. I make just very generic uh uh post and yeah. I'm not all too focused on it. But in time I'll develop my little schedule, I think, and and try to learn it a little bit better. Um it's a great, it's a free tool yeah. and it does get attention. I have sold through it. So yeah, yeah. I, I sell through it frequently. And as you know, a common, one of our common friends, Katie reads yeah. is the one who does all of my social media. Yeah. So you once in a while, dog. I'll just make a post. If I'm really anxious to show something, I'll make a post, but it yeah. does not, it fails in comparison to what she does for me. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's nice to have somebody that really knows yeah. what they're, what yeah, they're I'm doing. I'm taking a picture of a book and I'm, my shoes are showing on the ground, but you know, <laughs> with her, I don't have everything. So <laughs> wonderful and professional. So yeah. Yeah. She's, she's good at what she does. That's great. You got her in your corner. Yeah. yeah. I just did an interview with Katie and I really enjoyed it. She, she's a pretty driven uh, uh, girl and, and very nice. So uh, I was, that was my first time uh, meeting her. I know she's been in the space for a while. Oh, so. yeah. yeah. She's been it, for a long time. Yeah. So that was pretty. Sometimes I got to do a better job at at networking with people. It's honestly my my weak point. I, I just get so caught up moving around and busy. Um, I need to sometimes reach out and say hello every now and then. Yeah. But, you know, I'll get better at it. I, I better. <laughs> so. So people, people are going to watch this conversation and they're going to, you know, they're going to enjoy just the banter that we have back and forth mm -hmm. about books and bookstores. Mm -hmm. I encounter a lot of people who would love to own a bookstore. Mm -hmm. It's just this nostalgic, romantic idea yeah. they have. They have. Um, and, you know, I think that you have to have an online presence to have a bookstore, you know, from, for the most fact. Um, what advice would you give to someone who's contemplating this idea? Maybe they're retiring from their profession now. 
and maybe it's just time for them to do something different. They want to change a chapter in their lives. You've done it. You have documented it. You've done it. You've even talked about things you failed at and yeah. wish you could have lear relearned. Yeah. One of those things is you wish you had worked under an antiquarian yeah. bookseller. Yes. So what advice would you give to people who would love to do what you do? Well, um, there's multiple things and every situation is going to be different and everybody's characteristics are, are different. I did make a YouTube video on this that, it, that people can look up where I did lay out like what I wish I had done and what I couldn't have expected. Mm -hmm. What I would what I would say um, going into business for yourself is is um, if you were to apprentice, it would better prepare you. You got to know your numbers and you got to know if this is going to be feasible. You got to know when to pull the trigger too. Right. you can overanalyze all day. I know people that do this. Ideas are a dime a dozen. Right. You know what I'm saying? But until you're actually carrying it out, um, it really just comes down to the individual but i i would say first and foremost know your numbers be be strategic um uh if you're not see the tough thing is is like experience is everything the more times you handle the material you're you're going to learn more i guess it really depends on are you doing a new bookstore are you doing a mixture are you specializing where are you opening this bookstore? I would agree with you to online uh, uh, utilize that sure. so, uh, and learn that. There's so many different facets to this to this business, though. I mean, unless if you have a big pot of money, you're you're gonna have to get a little creative. There's the sourcing aspect, the marketing aspect. I could go on and on. Not everybody's cut out to work for themselves nor have the discipline to do it. And even if it's your passion, I don't necessarily think it's always the, the smart thing to do. Right. So um, I, I don't know if I'm answering your question or not, because I get lost in my you, chatter. No, you're, you're, you're answering it by by the you know way I'm, I've asked you the question. It's a lot of work. And, and, and Max, may I say, people yeah. make it look easy. But where I was 10 years ago is nowhere near right. where I was now. There's been tremendous growing pains. It, takes a, it does take a lot of discipline mm -hmm. and perseverance. I think that's one thing that separates most people from doing these things is when times are tough, you keep going forward. So right. You, so, okay. You, so this is interesting. Looking back now on your journey. Mm hmm 10 years now, correct? Yeah, uh, yeah, just about, yep. 10 years. What would you have done different knowing what you know now, other mm -hmm. than apprenticing, but what would you have done different in building what you have created? I'm very split on this, and it's very hard for me to say, because normally I would say I should have got on the online scene earlier. Okay. But because I didn't do that, I learned in a different way. I, I probably learned in a more traditional way, which has benefited me now mm -hmm. so i don't know if that necessarily uh of uh, would have helped or harmed my business may look a lot different than it does now um other than apprenticing i would say my own personal thing is i wouldn't have been drinking as much <laughs> <laughs> i was i was a 26 year old you know still wild right uh so i had to uh control my behavior um i one thing for sure is knowing my numbers, how to operate a business and what, and, and what that uh, entails uh, uh, for, for sure. <laughs> Maybe I would have read a couple business books or something. I, I don't but know. you know this, the beauty of reselling books is they're everywhere. You, yes. You can, you can build a store, I think, pretty cheaply if you know mm -hmm. where to source and you're good at sourcing. Yeah. Uh, of course, you'll progressively grow and have more inventory, mm -hmm. but I don't think that you have to spend a lot of money on the product you're selling. No, I started uh, $750. I bought out a unit of like 15,000 books. Now I've questioned my sanity since, but now I don't question it as much because it's right. rolling. Right. Uh, but that was kind of a crazy thing to do at the time of my life, but it, it's it's worked out. Um, yes, you don't need a lot of money. I think a lot of things come down to two. 
the building situation? Are you renting or owning? Mm -hmm. And look, uh, the real estate in this area is not very expensive. It's a lot easier to own. Where you're at, it's probably three times, four times here. So if I had it more than that. Yeah, I remember being down at St. Petersburg, like before the COVID thing, looking around going, man, I I think I'm going to be interested in getting a place down here. And then it shot up like, you know, four or five times. So, but pre-COVID, pre-COVID, you could have gotten a 10 by 20 storage unit down here, Mm -hmm. 200, maybe $250. Yep. Now that 10 by 20 is five to 700. It's an, it, incredible. So, you know, re, that kind of thing is a, a big factor. And I believe I mentioned in my video, I know three booksellers that um, they're either getting kicked out of their building because right. they don't own it. And what a meeting, shame. What it's a, shame. It is. And, you know, meeting that monthly uh, rental is a lot of stress to have over your head, especially if you're just starting. Um, so that's an, I guess, another thing that I, I would say it's, it's very multifaceted. We all have our different, uh, weaknesses too. So, um, you know, it, it, it does take quite a lot of discipline. You really gotta, you really gotta want it. Um, you gotta love it. I think to be in this business, I've said before, it's, it is a lifestyle, um, and it's not for everybody. Right. So. And it's not just about books. No. I mean, I, I I really feel like customer relations yes. goes yes. way, way deeper than than just selling books. It it absolutely does. Um, yeah, if you it, I mean, so there's booksellers I know that are pretty antisocial. Oh, yeah. They're not really people person. There's a lot of characters. Those, in this those, those are the older, older ones. <laughs> I, I know who you're talking yeah. about. There's a lot of characters. Yeah. I mean, so everybody has their own way about doing things. But, uh, you know, I, I'm, I, I, I do generally like most people. And when you share a common interest, it's pretty easy to talk with them. Right. Um, so I'm okay with that, with that aspect. Um, and it's benefited me greatly. People want to sell to me. They want to buy from me. Right. Uh, you know, so I'm a fairly likable character for the most part. Oh, you li- just, just about, just about. <laughs> so it helps. <laughs> it helps. So now, what, what would you warn? What would you warn against one or two things about someone who wanted to open up a bookstore mm-hmm. and say, Just watch out for these one or two things. I would say watch out for people taking advantage of you. Uh, uh, Experience some of that early on. Not that I really got taken advantage of uh, badly, but, um, you know, there are certain people, uh, they try to nickel and dime you constantly. And sometimes it's hard to be patient with them they make a good living, they can afford the book. And anymore, I'm like, look, I don't have to sell to you. And I don't even want to sell to you. So I mean, sometimes you could shoot yourself in the foot. But just be just be conscious. Not everybody has uh, uh, great intentions all the time. Uh, Don't uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Keep don't have I, I would warn against having too much of high expectations. A lot of people that you would think would have your back or be supportive won't be. Mm-hmm. And they're not also, a lot of them aren't going to understand what you're doing. They think you're crazy and you are a little crazy. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. You I know, know we talked about this last time. There was that one book called the gentle madness by Nicholas Bazabanes, all about <laughs> book hunters and collectors. And, mm-hmm. and yeah, you got to be a little crazy to do what do. we do. I know we love it. And maybe yeah. that's what makes us crazy is we love it so much. I, I know that I could never take you away from book selling now. No, no. It's in you. E- even if I sold it all, I would be doing it in one form or another. Yeah. There's yeah. no doubt about it. I yeah. enjoy it too much. Right. Because so. once you know the art of sourcing, once yeah. you know that mm-hmm. and you clearly understand how much is out there, which yeah. boggles my mind daily, how many phone calls I get. Yeah. It's, it's, it's hard to say no and, and just want to get more books for your business. 
<laughs> there's there's tremendous opportunity out there. You know, sometimes I would uh, I would feel like I need to buy everything, but I couldn't afford to for one, and you can't buy everything. So my mindset has changed quite a bit. Um, but there is plenty of opportunities out there, and uh, sometimes you got to get a little creative. But if you establish a trust with people, and um, they know you're not gonna, you know, uh, screw them over, basically, they'll want to sell you their their stuff. A lot of people generally they do want to see you be successful, and they will help you, whether that's word of mouth or you you know uh, getting you picks. It, it's a, it's a beautiful thing. Well, you, you know, you, I, I know you get phone calls and so somebody will invite you to their home to look at their collection, but is there a part of you uh, throughout the week who still would go to flea markets or you still want to go source in places you're not getting called to? I do that. Um, it, sometimes if the pick is, you know, an hour away mm -hmm. or something now, now I assess it out to make sure I think it's going to be worth my time. Of course, sure. Um, but what I'll do is I'll Google uh, shops that are close by it, especially mm -hmm. if it's an area I'm unfamiliar with, so that if by chance it doesn't exactly work out to how I want to, right. I'm still going to other locations on my travels. So Thrift, thrift stores, other bookshops? Well, the thrift stores aren't, aren't really great around here, okay. um, so I actually like going to antique shops. Okay. Um, that's my thing. Um, and uh, yeah, that's pretty predominantly where I'll go on my trip. Do you have antique malls up there or separate shops? There's one, but mostly it's separate shops. Okay. So, but you got to be careful on the area you're going to. If you're going to Cooperstown, which is the baseball hall of fame, yeah. a lot of tourism, their stuff is always priced higher because you got a lot of people coming in from the outside. I like going to those spots that are the hole in the walls. Um, right outside of the beaten path a little bit those are my favorite spots and usually i'm able to work with those dealers better the guys in the more populated areas right. I, I tend to stay away i always can find something but will, uh, will you look at craigslist before going say two or three hours away to see what if there's anything available two or three hours away on craigslist and using that as a sure. sourcing trip Sure, I have before. I don't do it as much, but I still do look. Like, I remember I had a buy in Jersey and then a buy in, like, I forget, the Hudson area once. So I set them up. So I hit Jersey first, made the pickup, went up to Hudson, made the pickup. Then I shot across the, the state to a couple more shops. So, right. and I found uh, the, the one through Craigslist. So, yeah, it does happen. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, Facebook marketplace. I haven't had as much success with yeah. not too interesting, but I look, I'm always yeah. looking. <laughs> yeah, I still think Craigslist is very viable for old books. And, uh, you know, mm -hmm. um, I think it's very, you know, there's, there's still a clientele that likes using. Yeah. Yes. Craigslist. Yeah. And so you can still find books there. My paper gold members have had great success. I think one of my members just bought 300 yearbooks. Wow. From a Craigslist ad. Um, and so, you know, there is a lot of money to be made from yearbooks that people don't realize. Yeah. There's a lot of things that go under the radar like that. Yeah. For yeah, that's sure. One of those categories. One of my members, um, just sold the yearbook. I think I told you this previously for $4,800. Amazing. Because Amazing. it had a uh, Heisman trophy winner in it. And mm -hmm. anytime you can get a celebrity or someone of fame yes. in a high school or collegiate yearbook, yeah, it's going for a lot of money. It's good as gold, man. That paper, paper gold. You yeah, know that paper gold. I, it, you know, I made a video probably four years back. It didn't really get any views, but it was on buying yearbooks, mm -hmm. and um, that I've had success with them. And you can, I mean, at least in my area, fairly readily find yearbooks. Right. And uh, there's so much stuff that goes under the radar. So much stuff that you can take advantage of. Um, as you know, what give, magazine, give the, give the view, give the viewers one from your vantage point and I'll give them one from my vantage point. And well, let's, well, we give them something, we give them something to chew on. Sure. Uh, like magazines, uh, uh, typically have gone under the radar. One of my largest sales was a magazine sale. Right. I can lot them together. Um, 
uh, different niche ones. Uh, what what, what I, was I, that magazine? What was the issue? So it it, it was um, uh, Staubach. He was a Heisman Trophy winner. Roger and, Staub Roger Staubach. Roger Staub Cowboys. Yeah. Yes, and it was set to be published during uh, JFK's assassination okay. happened. So they did a recall. So so there's only like 16 known to be in existence. I had one in the corner of my shop here. I would have gave it away to somebody if they like. But I saw I sold that for eighteen hundred dollars within a week, uh, rather quickly. And I where did that come from? How did you source that? Oh God! I Wait, the, the longer we talk, Phil, you know, I got ideas in my head. We need to be doing a weekly show on book finds. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's been some beautiful stuff that I've mistakenly found, yeah. like that one. That came from one of my early picks. And I'd have to think about it for a minute. Uh, but that's where that came from. That sat for quite a while until I uh, pulled it out and started doing a little looking into it. Right. Um, but but yeah, paper items. Oh, my gosh. There's so much stuff out there, as you know. What's one thing that has surprised you or that you found? Well, I love the exhibition catalogs. Um, from, from art galleries where may, maybe Picasso was doing an exhibition in, in 62 or something. Sure. It's not high dollar stuff. It, it's, it's 20 to $40 stuff. Mm -hmm. But, uh, look, you know, down here in South Florida, because we have a few museums yeah. and we have money in Miami, we have mon my money in Boca oh, yeah. Town and West Palm Beach. Oh, yeah. I, I get a lot of exhibition catalogs. They're only 16, maybe 24 pages. Mm -hmm. But I, you know, and, and I don't need to know every artist, you know, sure. they're very easy to spot, but those exhibition catalogs are, you know, they're a bread and butter in my store now. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, it's, it's, it's wonderful. Yeah. And a lot of this stuff, uh, uh, I will find on my book picks. Well, matter, of have... fact, matter of fact, I found two yesterday. I'll show them to you. Uh, Louise Nevelson, two exhibition catalogs. Oh, cool. Yep. Yeah. And I, I found those at the flea market. Not That's some, cool. not some, but um, mm -hmm. once I list those, I don't think they'll last more than thirty days. Very popular artists. Mm -hmm. They sell. I, yeah. I sold one last week for like thirty bucks. I forget the uh the artist name, mm -hmm. but um, yeah, I do. When I come across them, yep, bring in as many as you'd yeah. like. I I'll like take. when I go to the library sales and there's a box of them. <laughs> oh, it's wonderful. And, and then something... I make a deal on the whole box. And... <laughs> yeah. I'm sure those go yeah. over, overlooked at a library. Oh, yeah, yeah. That, that would be, you know, I mean, I agree with you with yearbooks. It's, it's to me, it's a number one thing to always buy. Mm -hmm. But if you're asking me, I think the exhibition catalogs for me in my store. Sure. That's definitely one that I love because, you know, you have art galleries all over the country. Matter of fact, yeah. These these are more from your neck of the woods. Yeah, these are from Rockland, Maine, mm -hmm. and somehow they made it down to South Florida. You, you know, well, th there's a ton of New Yorkers flooding into Florida. Right. As a couple of areas I've been in, it was like I thought I was in New York. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But I I love it. But uh, in upstate, there's a lot of downstaters that come up, and I mean, I've picked um, artists' homes and author homes. And a lot of them are involved in the arts in, in New York yeah, City. That's wonderful. So yeah. that stuff usually always comes with them. And all my book picks, it seems, there's always like some type of magazines or catalog collection. And they're not usually the, I like listing books first and foremost, but, mm -hmm. oh, we get them up when we get them right. for sure. Yeah, yep. but I know, I know you love the Infemer too. We've talked about that previously. You love the Infemer market and- and the yeah. mag magazines, I think we can do a whole show on magazines. A absolutely, you could. Completely Easy. underrated. Whether yes. it's a Mad Magazine or a Playboy Magazine, there's so yes. much to talk about. Um, even in those old Playboy magazines, the interviews with Ray Bradbury or Isaac Asimov or, yes. or a political figure, yes. uh, those those are worth so much so much money too. Oh God, they are. Yeah. They're there's also the if you go get earlier bound magazines um where an author's publishing for the first time you know they're called serial novels as you know things like this i had a buddy that picked up um edgar Allan poe's the raven uh serialized novels in an antique shop right there's still stuff out there you just you just gotta 
Yeah, look at the have, content. You have to know the author. So what I always tell people is go to the table of contents and see if you recognize any names. Yep. Because, uh, you know, the one thing I collected years and years ago, mm -hmm. um, and this started in college for me, was I was after the, unco un the uncollected J.D. Salinger stories. Oh, okay. So I would be looking in the old Good Housekeeping, the old McCall's, the old story magazines. Yeah. And if I ever found them, mm -hmm. that's the one thing I would collect. So at one time I had all of the, minus a few, but I had all of like all 22 of the unpublished or uncollected J.D. Salinger stories in their original magazines that they were what? published in. And um, so that's one thing that I did. But if you, if you know... If you if you have a good idea of society and culture and the arts and you go to the table of contents mm -hmm. and let's just say that there's an interview with Norman Mailer in yeah. a Playboy magazine, yeah. you can put that Norman Mailer in the title on eBay, Norman Mailer interview. And that Norman Mailer collector is going to buy that Playboy magazine because of that interview. Absolutely. Now, may I ask, uh, did you sell your Salinger? Years and years ago, and I still kick myself in the head. Did, did, did you sell it as a collection? or Yeah, in, yeah okay, I yep. sold it as a collection. I didn't sell it one by one. Um, of course, now, though, they are, subsequently, they've been all published and collected together, all the unpublished. You know, you can buy a book of them. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, you know, it kills me to say this. Most of them are very bad, very early. Nothing mm -hmm. like Catcher in the Rye, nothing yeah. like those New Yorker stories. Yeah, um, but you could you could see what he was doing. You could see he had a vision and he was going for it. And and, and so in those early Salinger stories, mm -hmm. you could see the progression uh, of this. You could see, you know, there were early versions of Catcher in the Rye mm -hmm. published as short stories. Well, that's 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 yeah. quite an accomplishment to yeah. uh, get them all together. That's wonderful. Well, I, I was a college student then uh, and I was in Boston. Mm -hmm. So I was in the right area. So anytime there was a library sale and they were getting rid of magazines, I had my little checklist of magazines I was still hunting for. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and my eyes would lighten up like yours do in your videos yep. when, I, when I would find one because, uh, you know, those beautiful Saturday evening post covers. Yeah. You know, yeah. I mean, just uh, it's phenomenal. Cool. And then you open it up and there's a Salinger story from 1943 or something. Oh, that's, that's really yeah. cool. That's yeah. awesome. But I don't I, do that anymore. That was another version of me. Um, do, do you collect that all anymore, Max? Zero. Yeah. Yep. Zero. Nothing. Yep. You said it earlier. I like owning it for a little while. Yeah. But in the end, I just want to move it on. I've been into too many hoarders homes. Yes. I've been into too many homes where someone has passed and their collection is there. Yeah. And it just leaves me with a feeling of be a better seller. Yeah. Sell your books. Don't collect them. This is for me. Um, I wouldn't, you know, I, I've seen how a book collection becomes other family members burden. Oh yeah. I'm working on two picks right now and that's ex exactly the case. You know, a lot of people will be, will ask me, they'll say, uh, boy, how can you sell these books? Like it must be tough. Well, you know, you, you got to have some type of emotional separation. Uh, yeah. But after going to how many orders house and seeing that that collection has been an absolute burden on the family, right? they, they don't know what to do. Uh, I mean, they, they people think they're going to live forever and they're not. And it's a, it's a lot of work to take care of. Um, and I, found, I found complete collections of someone's, you know, lifetime at flea markets where they passed away oh my god and and here comes all their collection in 38 boxes of books that's and, horrific you know, yeah you think they spent all that time working to build that collection yeah it, look, it's, it, sad it, too. It, it's it's sad it's too sad though. yeah I it mean, is you know i go to the flea market and i get a little tinge of sadness sometimes when when i'm you know oftentimes you'll find family albums of old polaroid pictures and yep. you're like boy, this person's life is now in the flea market. It's, uh, it's going to get thrown out if nobody buys the item. Yeah, it's, it, it is sad. I mean, it is fun to collect a little bit. Like I have books, but I don't collect like, 
you know, first edition, whatever. I have right. to sell those things. So it's like just general books that I want to read. Mm -hmm. I guess that's what I collect. Um, and I have some antiques that I like and stuff, but look, I, I don't, I value them to an extent, but if the whole house burnt down, it's like, well, that's really crappy. But <laughs> so at some point, unless there's somebody in my family wants something, right. it all will get sold. I'm not going to wait till I'm in my eighties and can't even enjoy it anymore. Right. And so many people do, they, they, they do. And, and they, they, after a while, they're owned by the collection instead of yeah. them owning the collection. Yes. Yes. That's what I see happening. Yeah. It's, it, it's too bad, but um, what, can, what can you do? You know, we see it from a different point of view for sure. Than and most. what we do is we buy it and then we resell it. That's what we do. Yes. <laughs> so, so every time we talk, I always say I want to be an hour, but it's never an hour. It's always oh. <laughs> long. So I, I'm going to work. We, we just finished an hour about 10 minutes ago. OK, <laughs> so I'm going to ask you the famous last question, which is the launch of what this show is all about. Mm -hmm. It's called Destination Unknown. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to have you verbally tell me of the next bookstore you want me to interview, the next owner of the bookstore you want me to interview. So I never know where I'm going, but mm -hmm. you do have to make the connection for me and okay. give them a phone call or, or email or whatever you do and let them know, you know, a good guy named Max who's mm -hmm. going to contact them. And that way I'm going to travel around the world, going to the favorite bookstores mm -hmm. of the bookstore owners. Cool. Very cool. Well, I do have a name for you. I'm going to keep you on the East coast. Okay. Uh, it's a guy who's, uh, has a YouTube channel running. He's been very supportive of my business. I've gone Beautiful. to visit him. Very smart guy, very sharp in the book business. Uh, Eric Pappenfuse, I think is how you say his okay. last name. Midtown Scholar Books in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. Oh, I'm excited. I'm I'm certain that he would be more than happy to do an interview with you. And Eric is uh, uh, very knowledgeable on a, on a wide range of things. I think you guys would have an enjoyable conversation. So more than this conversation. <laughs> well, let's not go too far. <laughs> It'll be all right. <laughs> but okay, he, so he, yeah, do the reach out for me. Okay, we'll do. And we'll um, do. then send me a message, and I will contact him. Um, and that will be that will be a destination uh, unknown episode two, hopefully. Wonderful. I'm just going to travel around the world and wherever books take me, that's where it's going to take me. Mm -hmm. That's and it, wonderful. And in the end, it's going to be a great collection of bookstore owners. And this is what I want to save and covet for the future. Well, I'm honored to be the first one on your channel. I thank you very much. And anybody out there listening, th thank you for uh, sticking with us. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I do. And Max, I, I wish you just, have still more and more bigger successes thank you and and you will we'll talk again anytime uh, uh this was a very enjoyable conversation thank you for having me all, all love from me to you as always we will talk very soon okay. thank you phil enjoy the rest of the weekend we'll see you too bye-bye